Well, hello everyone. Welcome to the International Interprofessional Mentorship Program. I'm Dr. Kate Barlow, your host and founder of the program. Today, Maggie Lamb is here um, and she's going to talk to us about feeding strategies for children with cerebral palsy. Today is June 1st, 2020. Please feel free to take yourselves off mute to ask questions at any time, or you can type your questions into the chat box and I will ask Maggie for you. At the conclusion of the meeting, we will have an optional meet and greet and David Thomford, the vice chair of the program, will also collect email addresses of participants who are able to attend the entire presentation and would like a certificate of attendance. Um, thank you all for coming today. And Maggie, please introduce yourself. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me. Hi, everybody. I'm Maggie Lamb. Um, and today I'm going to be discussing with you a team-based approach to feeding for children with cerebral palsy. A little bit about me before we get started. Um, I am a speech language pathologist. Right now I work at the HMS School for Children with Cerebral Palsy. We're located in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. We serve students ages five to 21 years old. Um, we are an approved private school, meaning if the student's general public school program can provide for their educational needs that either the school district themselves or the student's family work to get them in their appropriate education setting. And then we work with the family and the school district to see if HMS is the right fit for them. I also have experience working in the public school system. Um, so for the purposes of today's presentation, I'm really going to focus on students with cerebral palsy, but my experience in public school was working with students of a wide range of disabilities um, in preschool programs and in a high school program. So um, I might refer to other disabilities or low incidence populations. I received my ed education from Penn State and there I focused mostly in augmentative and alternative communication and literacy for students with complex communication needs. So if you have any interest in this area or questions in this area, um, that's something that really excites me. Um, so I'm happy to talk to you about that as well. And then lastly, um, Story International is a nonprofit that I volunteered with a little while back. But I know we have a global audience with us today. So in the creation of this presentation, I tried to draw on some of my experiences from volunteering abroad. Um, when I was in Guatemala, I was living in a really small town, um, five hours from Guatemala City, which was the closest, nearest, like largest hospital. Um, so I have a very small insight of what it's like when um, resources are a little bit limited. Um, so today for my presentation, I'm going to still share with you strategies that are evidence-based, but that I might not necessarily go to um, first in my workplace where I have a ton of resources, but I tried to draw on this experience a lot when my resources were a little bit more limited. So our learning objectives for today, there's three main objectives. And first, we'll go over some of the background about cerebral palsy and feeding in general. And then I'll explain the different roles of the professionals that I work with. And then I will try to apply the different strategies that I've learned from each professional throughout the year. I, I really want to make this as applicable as I can for different people. So maybe you're not working with students with CP necessarily, but you're working with adults with disabilities or other people with disabilities. So you might learn some strategies that I'll teach today or talk about today and it um, inspires some questions for you. So the next time 
you're working with a speech pathologist or um, a physical therapist, um, you kind of know different questions to ask and um, can think about things in a different way. So what exactly is cerebral palsy? Cerebral does mean brain and palsy means weakness, but cerebral palsy is really a group of disorders and we really see it characterized often in terms of movement and posture. It's really characterized by coordination and control of the muscular system, but we also can see accompanied disturbances in a student's sensation, their communication, uh, their behavior, or sometimes we'll see seizure, seizure disorders associated with CP. But the real hallmark is that control and coordination of the muscular system. There are different types. And again, we're, we're um, characterizing the types by how the muscular system is impacted. So in spastic, we're seeing more stiff muscle movements, whereas in athetoid, um, we're seeing a lot more involuntary, uncontrolled movements. And then in mixed, we're gonna see more difficulty with more uh, rhythmic, gait patterns and more difficulty with control and coordination. It's also characterized as diplegic, meaning it affects two limbs, and it's more common that it affects um, the legs than the arms. It can be hemiplegic, meaning half of the body, so um, the arm and leg on one side of the body, or it can be quadriplegic, meaning all four limbs. And then CP can also be congenital versus acquired. So congenital is, um, the etiologies really vary, but it's anything um, intrauterine or intrapartum, and we can see a variety of complications that cause congenital CP. And then acquired would be in that postnatal period, we typically see bacterial meningitis or encephalitis or some other type of brain injury. And then as I stated before, CP um, is characterized by um, how it impacts the muscular system, but we also do see difficulty with cognition and communication and other things. But today I'll really talk about comorbidities and other medical diagnoses directly in relation to feeding. So in talking about feeding and CP, first I'll just start by defining a few terms. So there's two terms feeding and swallowing difficulty versus dysphagia. And feeding and swallowing difficulty is more of this broad umbrella term, and it can include a diagnosis of dysphagia, but it does not have to when you hear this term. Um, it can include things like um, concern for nutritional intake, um, parents' concern for social isolation, whereas dysphagia is an assessed and diagnosed problem with one or more of the swallowing stages. And I could go all into dysphagia and CP, but that would take a whole presentation in itself. So real quick, the four stages, uh, phases of dysphagia are the oral prep, where um, food and liquid is manipulated in the mouth. The oral transit is where we start to move the food or liquid, that bolus, from the mouth to the back of the mouth um, and begin to initiate the swallow. But once that swallow is initiated, it starts the pharyngeal phase 
um, where um, it, the pharyngeal um, contractions start. And then once it gets to the esophagus um, down to the stomach is the esophageal phase. So if we see any lack of coordination or any issues in one of those areas, that could be a diagnosis of dysphagia. And we um, know that our students with CP are at high risk for a diagnosis of dysphagia. The severity of the motor disturbance is highly correlated with the feeding dysfunction, meaning maybe we have a student who is ambulatory but um, has some mild um, discoordination in their motor movements. And we might see some red flags, but maybe they just have a mild dysphagia, whereas a student who misses gross motor global developmental delays, we're going to see a lot more red flags in their case. And really, that's why assessment and intervention is going to be an ongoing cycle for our students with CP. Here we have, we're looking at a graphic from the International Classification of Functioning and Disability from the World Health Organization. And this framework was taken and adapted for feeding within CP. In the top up here, let me get my mouse. In the top here, you see the condition of CP. And in the middle, we have the body function and structure within the activity of feeding. And then we can look at the student's participation. And at the bottom, we have the student, uh, the contextual factors, which include the environmental and personal factors. So when I look at this, I kind of just say, whoa, there is a lot to think about when planning an assessment and treatment for our students with CP. But don't get overwhelmed in looking at this. There is a lot to think about, but this graphic also really helps us parse out this really complex web that is feeding. It helps you kind of get on the same page with other team members of what do we know and what do we still need to find out? What gaps are we missing? Um, where are our strengths and weaknesses? So I really like this visual. As the speech language pathologist when planning assessment, I tend to look here at the body function and structure. I want to know a ton about my students. Positioning, is there a history of dysphagia? What's their respiratory concerns? Is there a history of any reflux? What's their nutrition and hydration look like, et cetera? And a really, really thorough medical history will help me gain some of the answers to this. However, I wouldn't be a good clinician if I stopped here. When we go over to participation and thinking about both assessment and treatment, I can think about, is it the daily meal or is it something celebratory that we're eating for? At school, we have so many celebrations, which is great but we also have to think about how complex that changes everything. If you just change one little thing in this model, it changes so many things for the student's experience in eating. So in celebrations, we have more foreign foods for the students that they don't get on a daily, like cakes and ice creams, and when they're not used to eating that necessarily at school. Then down here in environmental factors, this is where I really rely on my occupational and physical therapist, therapist when I think about positioning, environment, um, 
thing or the utensils the supports needed for feeding or if i'm training a new feeder do they know about all of these things and then the personal factors this is where i can't stress enough how important the family is um, and i think this is a missing piece of the puzzle oftentimes but i have to think about i can be a little narrow-minded sometimes about okay, I have this great feeding plan and it works at school and, you know, why isn't it working at home? But when I remember that there's, where did my mouse go? Sorry. That I, when I remember, let me think about the family stressors and attitudes. What is feeding like at home? Or um, maybe the family has had some traumatic experiences trying to get their child to eat or is so worried about their child's nutritional intake that following my recommendations of tips and strategies is something really overwhelming. So again, I think this model is just really important to look at and talk about with each team member. So when talking about our different team members, we try to follow an interdisciplinary approach. And what exactly do I mean when I say interdisciplinary? A lot of times we hear the terms multidisciplinary, transdisciplinary, team-based approach, and the terms really are not one in the same, or we might say we're following one model when we're really doing another. So an interdisciplinary model really follows the principles of having a shared assessment and treatment goals for the student with mutual goals and timelines. So when a student comes in for an evaluation at our school, it really is our whole team present and i am always learning something from another team member of oh i really liked the way they asked that question or i wouldn't have thought to ask this question um, or education might be working with the student and i'll say are you seeing this the same way like i'm kind of getting this interpretation what do you think so it really helps to have your team members there for the assessment. And then for the treatment, we're really sharing those goals. So I share a ton of my goals with OT for feeding, um, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. And then um, you'll see that I called the title of this discussion, a team-based approach, but now I'm saying we should be doing interdisciplinary. And we really always strive to follow an interdisciplinary model. But when I was making this discussion and thinking about this talk, um, it's not always easy to, to work with your um, coworkers all the time and have those goals set straight all the time. So I felt a little bit of guilt and I changed the title of my presentation to a team-based approach, but we really do strive for this interdisciplinary approach. And I think we do a good job at following it, but there is always room for improvement. And who exactly is on this interdisciplinary team? It really is student specific um, depending on their strengths and their needs but it does include the parent the student the educator and any support staff in the classroom and then the therapists that are um, working with the student so it can be speech occupational physical respiratory um, i've worked with a lot of psychologists and behavior analysts in the past, um, social work, recreation, art and music therapy. Here I have a picture um, of something that our art therapist worked on with a student. She does a really fabulous job so, 
so the students can work on expressing themselves in an artistic way. Um, sometimes she'll take, she really learns the strengths of the students by either, you know, taking their shoes and socks off so they can paint with their feet if they're more mobile, using their lower limbs, or she'll put um, a paintbrush on a hat so they can move their head around and um, really works hard to make sure our students are met in that expressive area as well. And then the student's medical team is also independent um, or depends on the student themselves. So we want to include their primary care doctor and the nursing team, but then they may have GI needs or they may need a dietitian um, and so on and so forth. So um, I'll start off with the medical team because um, in following this model on the right here, they describe that the medical team is the foundation for the framework of feeding and swallowing safety that you really can't meet a student's needs of nutrition and swallowing and skill development until a student's medical needs are met. I have a link to where I got this resource from later in some resources, but I find um, this one extremely helpful, so I'll point that out. But I really do agree with this model. Um, an example is right now I'm working with a student who was making really great progress in terms of safety swallowing and skill development. This student was progressing in independence in these skills. Like everything you want for your student was happening, but they've had a change in their GI status and a lot of difficulty with reflux. Um, so right now, some of the um, behaviors that we were seeing was um, avoidance behaviors within meals, wanting to eat less um, in terms of quantity of food and being specific about what food they wanted to eat. And I had to work really hard with nursing to... Um, work as a liaison for medical management. I worked with PT to make sure the student was seated properly for reflux management, and then social work as a liaison for communication with the family about all of these things that we were observing at school. But this case really demonstrates that until the student's medical needs for reflux are managed, that my priority for skill development kind of goes out the window. I'm gonna work on maintenance, but I'm not gonna work on further development of skills. I included here on the slides other people that can be included in the medical team, but again, every student's specific and there can be more or less team members on the medical team. So some of my tips from the team, my first one is love your nurses and be really great to them. Um, my mom's a nurse, so I think I'm always partial to my nurses, but um, my nursing staff at my school is amazing and they serve our students well, but they're also the number one resource for obtaining the documentation I need about my student in regard to feeding management. Our kids have really complex medical histories and this isn't specific to my school. It's also been my experience with other students with disabilities, but their medical history is so important and critical to um, planning their feeding management. And without their knowledge, I can't do my job. And then my next tip from the team 
is on the right here, we see what we call this D-shaped spine and an anterior pelvic tilt. And what's happening, what, in my experience, I was working with a student who had a pretty good posture, um, but every, we started noticing just this D-shaped spine with the pelvic tilt about 30, 20 to 40 minutes after meals. And I noticed it and then I said something to his teachers and we really started to track and it was specific to after meal time. And we worked really closely with nursing to get this documented and brought to his primary care doctor. Um, and the student was having um, reflux symptoms, but was a nonverbal, really young student. Um, and this was something that because of the communication of our team, we were able to discuss and get a good diagnosis for the student. Next is physical therapy. And their sole response or big responsibility in terms of feeding management is proper seating. We know that proper seating helps with maximal posture control. And it's so important when working for our students to develop that mobility of the head, neck, and the trunk. When we think specifically about the trunk for feeding, just think about all of the organs that are housed inside of your trunk. Um, you have the respiratory system, you have your digestive system, you have bowel and bladder elimination. And so I really rely on my PTs to examine this space and figure out the best way to support our students in terms of positioning. And um, sometimes even I'll be working with a student and I'll have to get my PT to come in with me and just say, the student doesn't look right today. Um, can you help me reseat them better? I'm not quite sure what the best approach is. So I wanna have a little experiment right now. Um, just while I'm explaining this slide, I want everybody to try to lift your feet and legs in the air while I talk. And I'll tell you when to put them down. Um, and if you're seated on the floor, just bring your legs up so you're slightly uncomfortable and feeling like you need to hold your legs a little. So we know proper seating is important when we talk about feeding, but our goal is that we really want a perfect 90-90-90 positioning. So what I mean is 90 degrees at the ankles, 90 degrees at the knees, and 90 degrees at the hips. Okay, you can all put your feet down. So I just want everybody to think about how hard that was to concentrate on what I was trying to tell you as your feet were up or your legs were up. Um, when you couldn't find where your body was in space, you needed to engage your core and then you also needed to try to focus. I know I had some trouble. Okay, like what am I talking about? Um, so, but when our students aren't seated correctly, this is what they're experiencing on a regular basis. They're trying to figure out where is my body in space and they don't always have the proper muscular systems to um, engage their core and make up in the way that we do. So we're talking about just seating in general, but when we're talking about seating in terms of feeding, it's this extra sensory demand that we're placing on our students. So that's why seating for feeding is so critical. Here on the left, 
we can see this student has the 90-90-90 I referred to here at their ankles, their knees, but not quite at their hip. Um, and uh, we want to know what we can do for a better aligned spine and better head and neck positioning. So over here on the right, the student has pretty good um, back support and even a headrest. Sometimes our students have good trunk control, so they don't need quite as much support laterally or at their head, but all they need is maybe a foot plate to know where their body is in space and get that 90 degree angle at their feet and ankles. And I know there are a wide variety of commercially available chairs that, you know, at school, I have them, the, the, if the student doesn't fit in a chair, I can kind of go find another one and things like that. But that's a luxury I have at my current school. That was not the case at my last school. So sometimes we have to get a little bit creative. So another tip and trick I have is um, either a yoga block or a cinder block. So sometimes we don't always have the proper foot plate, but what's something sturdy that is not also a tripping hazard, but what's something sturdy that we can give that foundation to allow the student to know where their body is in space and put under their feet. And then one of our HMS favorites at school, we're always rolling up towels and or um, even like a clothing protector and rolling them up to um, create the support and space we need. So maybe a student is not seated at midline and they're a little bit off. Can we place one laterally under their arm to give them that proper placement? Or back here, if we placed one behind their head, or if you can see me, if we place one behind my head, would that just give me that little bit of support to reduce the cervical extension and bring my chin down? So my role as the speech pathologist is really to assess and figure out treatment for the student's oral motor needs and the swallowing function. So at HMS, when a student comes in, we will do assessment and look at everything, their language needs and um, everything like that. But in terms of feeding, we do a really thorough case history before they come in. But when a student comes in, that's where I really work closely with the family to figure out how we can best support the student. What has worked in the past, what diet is the current, what diet is the student currently on? Meaning, um, are they on like a modified texture? Um, and we work really closely with OT to do some co-treats within meals to find out the student's strengths and challenges. Sometimes students are tube fed and it's either to supplement their oral feeds or students rely on tube feeding as their primary means of nutrition. And this has been a little bit of a myth that I've learned about of, you know, oh, this student has a tube feed, we don't feed them or oral care isn't a part of their program. Um, and during my year at HMS, I'm really learning how important this is if we don't try to teach the skill, then the student never has the opportunity to learn the skill. So in oral motor intervention is still appropriate um, when working with a speech language pathologist. Um, so we have some students that rely solely on um, tube feeding for their nutrition, but might get um, small tastes 
and different oral experiences to still work on secretion management or just pleasure when it's a celebration at school or things like that. And some of my tips and tricks. Um, so my first one is to use cervical auscultation, um, which can be used to assess the student's respiratory status before and during the swallow. Um, if you place a stethoscope on a student's neck, um, laterally to the trachea and superior to the cricoid cartilage, what you do is you listen for changes in respiratory sounds. So it's not a method to um, definitely identify aspiration or anything like that. And you cannot visualize the structures in the same ways that you can with um, a, fiber, uh, a fees or other types of assessments. But when you're in really remote areas or when a student comes in for their first assessment, this is absolutely something I do um, because I've read a lot on paper, but it is another way for me to learn about the student. So I'm actually going to stop sharing my video so I can show you this and the next um, strategy a little closer and you're not staring at me in a small box up top. Okay. Um, so for cervical auscultation, all you need is a stethoscope. I'm gonna leave that one in so you guys can hear me still. And what you would do, Kate, can you still hear me okay? It's Okay. Yes, and I was just going to say, for those of you, if she's still small on your screen, if you click on her box, there's a way you can spotlight her video and then her screen gets really big. So if she's small right now, you have to click on spotlight video and then Maggie's face will get twice the size. Thank you. So um, again, you would place, I'm not demonstrating this on myself, but usually I'd have the stethoscope and this would be placed on the student, but I'm going to demonstrate using my own throat. Um, so I would place it and then all I would do is kind of listen to the student's airway and respiratory status. And then I would give my first trial of either a drink or the food, whatever is appropriate for the student. And that's where I listen. I had to let go so I could hold my mic and my drink. But that's specifically where I'm listening. And it does take a, a little while to get used to. Um, it's something I used when I was in the hospital all the time at a patient's bedside. Um, and me and my uh, speech therapy, other graduate friends would practice on each other. So we really knew what normal sounded like. And it did take a while for me to figure out, okay, this, I know this didn't sound right, but I'm not sure exactly what's happening. But once you get pretty skilled in this area, um, you, sometimes you can hear the food spilling back. Hi, okay, were you able to see that? You went out like the last minute and a half, but I started, I could see the stethoscope here, but then you, you, we lost your screen. Okay, could, and you could still hear me though? Yes. Okay. Could you, would you mind doing it one more time? Nope, that's fine. So I'd be listening for the respiration of the student. What does it sound like before we're giving any type of drink or food? Airway sounds good, okay. And then that's when I would present it. 
and then I swallow. So with the student, um, you guys can try this like with each other to know what normal sounds like. Um, or you can talk to a speech pathologist and work with them closely if you're with them doing swallowing. Um, maybe they do it first and let you hear and then they can explain like what's happening. My next tip and trick, um, I tried to take pictures of it for my slides, but it's easier just to show you. So I call it the, we call it at HMS like a three point support. So what I have is like my, my thumb, my pointer finger and my middle finger. And what you can do is give the student a different amount of support depending on what they need. So you can give jaw support, chin support, or lower lip support when feeding or drinking. Um, so it does take, when I teach my interns that come in, it takes a skilled hand and a lot of practice, but, and depending on what the student needs. But if I'm just trying to give some head support, if my student um, tends to have more of a droopy head while they're feeding, I want their head to be more up in midline. So I might just give a one hand or one finger support. But now I've presented something to eat and they're kind of just holding it. So I want to give some lower jaw support. That's when I would take my second finger and I might give them support under their chin. So from the side, it looks like this. Or maybe my student has pretty weak lip muscles, and this is where I might give all three fingers, and I can, um, it's hard to talk and do it at the same time, but you can give lower lip support for the student and then it depends on how much pressure you're giving so maybe the student needs a lot of support under the lips but not as much here and you can relax your pressure so that's something I utilize in feeding treatment and intervention regularly and again it just depends on knowing the student and it takes like a skilled hand. Sometimes I'm feeding from this side or sometimes I'm feeding from this side and you have to switch hands. But again, something to talk to um, your therapist about if you're trying to feed a student what type of support the student needs. Okay, I'm going to go. Can I interrupt you real quick? Absolutely. Okay, so when you were placing the stethoscope, where exactly were you placing it? So you want it lateral to the trachea, but then above the cricoid cartilage. So I usually place it like about here, but that's on myself. So you kind of have to like feel for the student's anatomy a little bit. And is there a name for this technique? It is called, um, it's in my slides, I'll go back, but it is called cervical auscultation. Um, and it is a little bit controversial in the field because some people say like you cannot um, figure out if a, if a person is aspirating from this. So I'm not saying you're going to be able to diagnose anything, but it does help you suspect what's happening. Like you can hear the difference between a normal swallow and an abnormal swallow. So if you're in an area of the world and you, you don't have, you know, um, a fees or things like that, this is a studied method to try. And then that's where, when you're hearing it and like, something's wrong, something's wrong. You can't see the anatomy, but it's another way to hear and assess what's going on. Um, and it kind of just gives me another way to like, okay, I'm looking at my student, but now I can be listening too. So just one more tool in the tool chest, in your toolbox. Yeah, I for sure. You. Thank you. You're welcome. And here's the name of it right here. Um, A 
Okay, my slides are frozen, but they'll catch up. And remember everyone, you can type any questions that you may have in the chat box. I'm monitoring this the whole time, or you can take yourselves off mute and ask Maggie directly. So this was just where I was trying to picture for you, but I think it was a little easier um, me demonstrating live. And then occupational therapy. Last but not least, certainly not least, um, but I really rely on them for assessing and planning for the students' sensory, motor, and oral needs and adapting any of the utensils or trays for and implementing this assistive technology. And when I say assistive technology, I mean the utensils, seating, um, and special supports for feeding, not assistive technology for communication. That's more my role as the speech pathologist. Um, and my co-treats with OT, I just value them and love them so much. Um, I really work with the OT to know what are your goals for the student? Are they working on self-feeding? Are you working on a two-hand support to bring a cup to their mouth? But I need to know their goals so I can carry them out in my feeding sessions for the student. But equally, they need to know my goals for the student so the student can feed safely within their sessions. So I don't expect my occupational therapist to try a new food for the student, but I do expect my occupational therapist to know when my student is sitting with their mouth open that they need this type of support or whatever it is specific for the student. And some of my tips and tricks that I've learned from my therapist over the years. Um, eating is just this multi-sensory process. We have so many processes we use just for a meal. Um, and I've heard it said that the OT is only responsible for intervention for a student to get the food from the plate to the mouth, that's OT's realm, but speech's realm is in the mouth to the stomach. And it can be a broad way to think about it, but I think we overlap in the mouth. Um, the OTs have so much knowledge about proprioception and interception and, my stu in, um, and the student's tactile needs. And all of that is happening inside the student's mouth. And feeding is a multi-sensory experience. So I kind of like to get rid of that myth and um, integrate our uh, professions a little bit more. Um, another thing I've done um, is this three-day diet. And I apologize that I don't have it hyperlinked here for you. Um, but what it is, is just for three days, you can work to document everything the student eats. So sometimes it's like a little diary that goes home between school and um, goes back and forth between home and school. And you want to take down the date, um, the time the student is eating what they are eating, all the way down to the brand, if you can, um, um, how much they're eating, whether they're eating by, by cup or by um, a utensil, um, and then by mouth or by feeding tube. Um, and the ones that I've completed for my students have been really helpful in terms of working with a dietitian in terms of nutritional intake, but how I've worked with them with my OTs is kind of looking, the one specifically that comes to mind is I had a student who was getting adequate nutrition. We did end up bringing it to a dietitian, but when we looked at it um, broadly, the student was eating things like chicken, crackers, 
um, pasta with nothing on them, um, applesauce, and then like cooked vegetables and fruits. So we realized the need for some more tactile input. The student was only eating really, really soft foods. The student was eating pretty bland foods. When you look at like chicken, crackers, rice, um, and the student wasn't a picky eater. The student loved to eat, just had some preferences. So we worked with the family, um, OT and I, about just educating the family, you know, could they add cinnamon to applesauce? Could they add barbecue sauce to chicken or some type of sauce to chicken um, to add another textural and flavor profile to the students' meals? So we started really small in suggestions like that. Some other needs, um, a lot of our students have visual impairment, so doing small things just like changing the color of the bowl or putting tape around the perimeter of the student's tray or eating area, or if you're trying to teach a student to scoop, giving them like the perimeter of their bowl with a different colored tape so they can see where they are trying to scoop. Um, or our students who are not self-feeding, sometimes um, they're feeling like a little ambushed of like, oh, all of a sudden this spoon's in my mouth. We know our students have difficulty with sensation, so they might not be smelling. And if they have visual impairment, they're not seeing the spoon come to them. Um, but if they have some vision, you can add a target, um, brightly colored. This one is like a shinier material to bring in some light. Um, and those are different suggestions for visual impairment. And lastly, I really depend on my OTs for most of this um, utensil adaptation, but there's a wide variety of things commercially available, um, but sometimes like we will just take a pool noodle to see like, is this the depth this student needs? Is this the thickness? Does the student need a heavy utensil or a really light utensil? Um, and then things like the curvature, I rely on the OT for determining what the student needs but you don't always have to buy something really fancy. We take some of our utensils to the person who fixes our wheelchairs and he actually bends and welds our utensils for us just so we can really try different things before purchasing anything that's crazy expensive or that might not work for the student. Um, and I know when I was in Guatemala, this like, wouldn't work at my school, but we actually just used like art clay and put it around the students' utensils and let it dry out so they had like a thick, hard, firm um, uh, grip to grab. And that's what we did for that student. So I've added some additional materials um, back on the medical team page, I had that graphic and that comes from this guide for clinicians. And I really love this guide. It goes through different developmental processes and it's meant specifically for students with complex needs. And then in terms of communication, um, like I said at the beginning, I work also with students with complex communication needs. Um, the communication matrix is one of my favorite tools. Um, it is currently a free resource and it's in multiple languages. Starting in July, they will start charging small fees if you use it more than five times a year. But what it is, is it's an assessment tool that helps you determine where your student is expressively in their language if they are nonverbal, 
um, and in really early stages of language development. But it's also nice because it's um, kind of like an online community where you can go on and ask questions um, and it's other people working with students of this population. Um, so you can get ideas there. So part of it's an assessment and then the other part is really this forum and community based tool. And I have some references included here. And just thank you for inviting me today. And here is my email if anybody has questions later. But if you want to open it up, Kate. Yes, thank you. And Maggie, um, can I send out the PDF version of your PowerPoint after today? Absolutely. OK, great. So this is being recorded and it will go up on the AIC OER page for future reference and I'll send you a link as well. And I'll also send out Maggie's PowerPoint. Does anyone have any questions? 